Moses writes about the righteousness that is based on the law, that the person who does the commandments shall live by them. But the righteousness based on faith says, do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down, or who will ascend into the abyss, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your heart, sorry, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and, sinned and is saved. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame, for there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. Thank you, brother. Grab a seat. Thank you, Nathaniel. I appreciate that so much. If I were to walk out these doors this morning and go into the Geneva community that we know really well and ask people two questions, um, I believe the answers would probably fall into some kind of sequential, natural order, very predictable probably. And let me explain to you what I mean by that. Uh, if I went out and I asked people, question number one is this, what is your greatest problem or need in life? Question number two is this, what are you going to be doing today? And so the reason why I think that those questions probably would fall into some kind of sequence is because if a person perceives that their greatest need is more money, what should they probably be doing today? Hey, hope so, right? That of robbing a bank, whatever they choose to, to, to. No, I'm just kidding. Do not do that. I'm just kidding. Um, finding some way to get some income, right? Um, if a person's greatest perceived need was some type of disease, right? They're going to spend their time today um, probably calling doctors or going to doctor's visits or, like I do, looking at YouTube and self-diagnosing. Um, <laughs> not a great strategy, but it works. Um, if you felt today that your greatest need was loneliness, if I ask them that question, then they're probably going to go online and create a dating profile or, or go to some social place where there's a lot of people. Here's what I'm, I'm just trying to get at, and make sure you're tracking with me. Whatever you feel is your greatest perceived need impacts what you do day to day. Okay? Well, in our passage today, Paul's going to logically flow from what he considers theologically your greatest need today and mine, which is to be right with God. And he's going to say that if that is truly your greatest need, then it should lead you to a point of action, which is taking the gospel to all peoples. And I'm convinced today, this is why you see so very little evangelism going on, is because people maybe have forgotten or shrunk back our greatest need so therefore, we don't find the cause of sharing the gospel to be the most important task of our day. Are you following with me? Amen. All right, great. We're good. All right, let's dive in. Romans 10, verse 5. For Moses writes about the righteousness that is based on the law, that the person who does the commandments shall live by them. See, this is our greatest problem in any person's life. And you, you might have thought, Thanks, Aaron. What a great way to start out things. I've got a problem. Maybe I didn't even know about. Here's the problem. How can you be righteous or simplified right before God in a relationship with him? And you may say, well, why is this my greatest need? You may say things like, I've lived a good life. I'm better than, we can always point to somebody, right? John, right? <laughs> Sorry, John. <laughs> Not from Indiana, huh? <laughs> I don't take things from other people. I'm not like these people I see 
on the news. I'm a hard worker. I put my hands to the plow and plow. I'm just a happy guy living my Florida life, not troubling anybody else. I'm right with God. I'm sure. We're fine. We got a little thing going here. See, the problem with this perspective is that it's very one-sided. Did you notice that? What was the word I repeated over and over again? Aye, aye, everybody got it, right? See, we may be fully convinced that we're right with God, but what we need to realize is that God has not been silent on these matters. Psalms resist, Psalms 14, verses 2 and 3. The Lord looks down from heaven on the children of man to see if there are any who understand, who seek after God. They have all turned aside. They have become corrupt. There is none who does good, not even one. And I know what happens right about now. You start self-justifying. I'm not as bad as this. Maybe that's just an Old Testament verse, right? You know, that's not about me. Well, hold on, hold on, hold on. 1 John 1.8 says that if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. So according to this verse, who's the sinner? Raise your hand. Okay, I'm trying to see who didn't raise their hand. No, just <laughs> Making sure you're with me, okay? Well, here's the other thing. If you don't think that you're a sinner, well, Romans 6.23 says that the wages of sin is death. And it may be a slow march for you. Others, it may be a faster march. We may see the coffin in the near future. But every person, if, if I held this service again, and first of all, I won't be here to hold it, but if we held this service in 100 years from, one, from, from today, how many of you are still here? Maybe a child. I mean, if they're incredibly fortunate. So what this means is that the payment for a sin is that you're going to die. So therefore, who's a sinner? All are. And here's what the scripture says. Our sin separates us from God. This makes our greatest need today to be right before this God. The prophet Isaiah writes about this in chapter 59, verses 1 and 2. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save or his ear dull that it cannot hear. But follow this. But your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. So whether or not we acknowledge it or not today, our greatest need is to be made right with this God. I mean, did you hear what we just sung? He commands... All the host of heaven. They do exactly what he says to do. Kings, the most mighty in this land, will one day fall on their faces before this God. He's got a glory that the scripture says it consumes like a fire. And each one of us will stand before this God one day. And by your own profession, you said this morning that you are a sinner. You bear the weight of that sin, death in your very veins. So to say that we have a dilemma this morning, I hope we haven't underappreciated that dilemma. Does that make sense, beloved? So easy, right? Moses gives us one option in verse 5 of Romans uh, 10. Moses' option is this. God gave the law and said that that is what is required to be in a right relationship with me. Moses writes about this in Leviticus 18, verse 5. You shall therefore keep my statutes and my rules. If a person does them and he shall live by them, I am the Lord. In, in larger context, what God's telling Israel is that, listen, you've got to live differently. And he's establishing that there is a way that God requires you to live your life if you desire to be in a right relationship with him. So let me ask you a question. God's given the law. If you followed every jot and tittle of the law perfectly, would you be right in God's sight? Yes, absolutely you will. You would be called righteous then, right? Before God. Jesus talks about this, though. 
Matthew 5, 17 through 20. Do not think that I've come to abolish the law and the prophets. I've not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Two things I want to point out to you in this passage. We need to be better at the law than the scribes and Pharisees. No problem, right? I think this is kind of what they were like. This is really not, but it's a pretty funny joke. You shout like that, they, they put you in jail right away. No trial, no, no nothing. Journalists, we have a special jail for journalists. You're stealing, right to jail. You're playing music too loud, right to jail, right away. You're driving too fast, jail. Slow, jail. You're charging too high prices for uh, sweaters, glasses. You right to jail. You undercook fish, believe it or not, jail. You overcook chicken, also jail. Undercook, overcook. You make an appointment with a dentist and you don't show up, believe it or not, jail, right away. <laughs> may or may not have been a Pharisee, I'm not sure. But it gets you the idea, right? <laughs> Keep in mind, these Pharisees would not spit on the Sabbath because if they spit and the dirt curled up, they might be guilty of farming. And Jesus says they're not following the law enough. They're not living right enough. How are we doing? See, by the law, it's impossible to be made right before God is what Jesus is really saying. But the second thing I want you to note in this passage is verse 17. I have not come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. And this is our clue. There is another way to be right before your God today. Romans 10, 6 says this. By the righteousness based on, but the righteousness based on faith says, do not say in your heart, who shall ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down, or who will descend into the abyss, that is to bring Christ from the dead. See, there is another righteousness that's not based upon works, but on what? Faith. See, righteousness by the law says you've got to do this and do that and do this, right? I love this verse. It says righteousness by faith doesn't say who's going to ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down, or who's going to go into the deeper portions of the earth and bring Christ back from the dead. You know, very similar wording uh, to a passage in Deuteronomy 30, 11 through 14, that reads this. For this commandment that I command you today is not too hard for you, neither is it far off. It is not in heaven that you should say, who will ascend into heaven for us and bring it to us, that we may hear it and do it. Neither is it beyond the sea that you should say, who will go over the sea to us and bring it to us, that we may hear it and do it. But the word is near to you. It is in your mouth and in your heart so that you can do it. You notice the similar wording? See, the essence of both passages is the same thing. There is a way to be right before your God. But it's not like a mountain. I mean, if, go climb that mountain and you'll be right before your God. Man, I'll figure it out, right? It's not like a sea that you have to cross over and be a warrior and fight across the sea. It says there's a righteousness before your God that depends far less on human effort than you might think. It isn't far from you. It's in your heart. It's in your mouth. Let me ask you, who brought Christ down? God did. Who brought Christ up from the dead? Yes, he's done that. 
And kids, if you're thinking about some kind of adventure story, right, where the hero goes and conquers some mighty foes to win the battle, forget that. (laughs) Righteousness with God is nothing like that. And I think I get it. See, we want to attain right standing with God in some manner of human effort. Because ultimately, we want to save ourselves, right? We want at least, uh, this is for the, the younger generation, we at least want a participation trophy in righteousness, right? <laughs> and here's what I think is really going on here. Do you guys remember the story of Naaman uh, in 2 Kings 5? He's the commander of the army of Aram, and he gets leprosy. And there's, there's a little lady there, a slave girl, and she says, hey, Send him to Israel. Over there, there's people that could heal him. And the king finds out that this foreign army is sending him over there. He's like, he rips his clothes. Like, how can I heal somebody? And I love it. Elisha says, send him down to my house. And he comes down to his house. And Elisha says, I want you, he doesn't even come out to talk to him. He sends somebody out to tell him this. He says, hey, just go down the river, dip yourself seven times, you'll be fine. Anybody know what Naaman does? He gets angry. Man, there's waters in my own hometown. Could have went and dipped myself in that. Why why did he come out here and rub his hand and call on the power of God and heal me? And he walks away angry. But one of his servants is with him. He goes, hey, question, man. If the prophet would have told you to do some great military conquest, would you have done it? He's like, why don't you do the simple thing he asked you to do? If he told you to swim, climb a mountain or swim the ocean, you would have done it. And what he does is he finally listens. And he goes down and dips himself seven times and he comes up what? Clean. Clean. See, I think this is us too, isn't it? We would absolutely do any kind of right thing. Man, if I could be right with God by just doing, just tell me what to do. But why not just do the simple thing the Lord said? We don't need to descend into the abyss or climb the heavens. God's already done that, right? Why? Romans 10, 8 says this. But what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. See, the word is near to us today. Where is it? (laughs) It's in your mouth. Don't cancel your appointment with the dentist, apparently, according to that video. We would be in trouble. It's in your mouth. It's in your heart if you want to point down a little further, right? You don't have to fight bears or stab giants to get there today. Righteousness with God, being in right relationship with your God, is attainable today by faith alone. And see, faith is the function of confession and belief. And it's a gift of God, according to Ephesians 2. It must be given today. But don't miss this. I want to boil this down simple, because I think oftentimes people miss the gospel because they want to be Nahum, right? They want it to be more complex. There's two things that the scripture says that you have to do today. One is believe. And what? That the Lord Jesus is God. That he was raised from the dead. Paul talks about this too in 1 Corinthians 15. Sorry. One behind. For I delivered to you as of first importance that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scripture, that he was buried and he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scripture. Again, our righteousness by faith means that you must believe these things. These things are what was the answer to Nicodemus' question. How can a person be saved, born again, right? Well, here's what he said. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him, see it again, should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, 
but in order that the world might be saved through him. See, he didn't need to send his son to condemn the world. Why? It was already condemned. Sin has already condemned the world. God sends his son to save the world. Whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. So first is belief today. A firm, rooted conviction that Christ died for your sins, was buried and resurrected. But we can't leave it there. Look at verse 10. For with the heart one believes, okay, we've addressed that and justified, but with the what? Mouth one confesses and is saved. This is the public declaration of what you believe inside. John 10, or I'm sorry, Matthew 10 talks about this. Jesus himself said these words in verse 32 and 33. So whoever would acknowledge me before men, I will also acknowledge him before the Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. See, confession is public. Paul writes about Timothy's confession, and he said he did it in the presence of many witnesses. Confess with your mouth. What do you confess with your mouth? You confess your lostness, your inability to save yourself, your need for Christ. Confess that you are right with God only by Christ and his life, his death, his resurrection. You know, baptism is one of the greatest moments to be able to do that, right? Because I always allow people I'm baptizing to open their mouth and tell you, this is what I'm doing today, right? That I am like Christ went into the grave and came out. I've done that. There's a few moments, right? We're going to have a response time. And you can come up here and we will put a microphone in your hand and you can testify to this congregation that I believe Christ died for my sins, was buried and resurrected. That's confession, right? But don't limit it at one or the other. Well, I've got belief in my heart. I don't really have to confess it. You're not saved. If you haven't made the public confession, you're not saved today. See, this is your Nahum moment, right? Come down. Confess Christ. But it's too simple. I would be like the the servant that says, if he would have said do something crazy, you would have done it, right? That's what's required of you today to be right with your God. Confession. Paul writes that with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. And if you believe the gospel that Christ raised, was raised from the dead, the scripture says you will be saved. Amen? Amen. Amen. Romans 10, 11, and 12, 13. For scripture says, whoever, anyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. What great hope that is, right? That's the only thing you hear today. Call upon the name of the Lord. Amen. See what Paul's doing here uh, in Romans 9, which we didn't read that obviously, but 933, he's quoting a passage actually from Isaiah, which is getting a little stringy here. But uh, Isaiah 28, 16 says this, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone of stumbling, a rock of fence, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. And this is bringing that passage back in. Everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. The Jew, the Greek. Basically, that's if you are a Jewish ancestry or today you're anyone else ancestry. The same way that you come to God is the same way that you confess and believe in your heart. By faith in Christ alone. There are no back doors into heaven, beloved. Everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. And we know that that's not just empty words, right? That's firm, effectual conviction of Christ, which is a work of the Holy Spirit. See, this is how we're made right before our God. If being right before your God is your most pressing problem today, which it is. Yeah. Amen? Amen? 60%, 60% maybe? <laughs> which is our most pressing problem today. There we go. We'll take it. Then naturally, that should impact what we do, right? That's the logic here, and that's the flow of Paul's thought. Romans 10, 14. How will they call on him whom they've never believed? 
And how are they to believe in him whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? So we are right with God based upon faith. Tell others how that happened. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I woke up somebody, I know. I saw somebody jump, <laughs> saw somebody jump over here. <laughs> so we should be like beggars, right? We're beggars that found bread. And we go tell other beggars what we found, right? I'll never forget, I was working our benevolent ministry in Kentucky. And I'd go buy $15 gas cards. And one person would come in and get a gas card because we'd try to help people out, right, something. Next thing you know, I'd have 50 people coming in to get gas cards. And how did they all know? They all have different addresses. I'm looking at the IDs. It's because they go and tell each other, hey, go there. They've got something for you. That should be us, right? We have had our greatest problem solved by Christ. It should impact the heart. There should be burning. Paul asks three how questions here. Let's look at these briefly, right? The first question is, how will they call him? I'm sorry. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? The answer is what? They can't. They can't. Hebrews 11 says this. Without faith it is impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. So here's the thing. If they don't believe in God, they can't draw near to him. There must be some type of change that happens. Again, back in 14. And how are they to believe in him whom they have never heard? If they never heard the gospel, can they believe? No, the answer is they can't, right? The need is clear. They need to hear the gospel. So how does God desire that to happen? And how they will hear without someone preaching. For people to hear and believe, they need to hear something specific, which is preaching. They need to hear that Christ died for your sins, was buried, and now he lives. They need to hear that God now commands people everywhere to repent and believe the gospel. They need someone to preach. But there's one more how question here. And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. How can they preach unless they're sent? The answer is they can't. See, this is where our greatest problem being met, being right before God, impacts what we do with our lives. It should. If there's a breakdown here, there's a real problem, right? See, we as a local church... We send people to preach the same gospel that we cling to as a treasure. It is a treasure, right? See, the heart that understands the greatness of our salvation will not stop at any cost to proclaim the gospel and make sure others get that opportunity, right? I love it. God has ordained ordinary means of preaching to accomplish extraordinary things. Men and women being sent out from a church, open their mouths, proclaim Christ, and the power of the Spirit moves. God supernaturally changes hearts when they hear the good news. It seems too simple, doesn't it? Don't be Nahum. See, we see an example of this in Acts 13, and I hope this will hit home here in a minute. It may not at first, but you'll get it in a minute. Acts 13, 1 through 3. Now, they were in the church at Antioch, prophets, uh, teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, uh, who is called Niger, uh, Lucius of Cyrene. We'll go through these here. In verse 2, while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work in which I have called them. And then after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and they sent them off. Can you imagine? Pastor Conrad's out. We could have a little fun, right? <laughs> you guys feeling loose today? No, <laughs> We got elders here. We got to be careful still. <laughs> Imagine. Hey, guys, we're going to do a little prayer service here for a second. Ben, where are you at? You back there, brother? We start praying, and it's clear. A couple people come up and go, man, I feel like the Spirit just said we need to send Ben to Iraq. Philip's like, he's prepared. I've been working on him in my household for all these years. We as a church go, 
Ben, are you agreeable? Ben's agreeable. Ben's like, my life is for the Lord's glory. We go, Ben, we're going to sponsor you and make sure you have no need that we can't meet outside of things that only God can meet. And we're going to send you out. We're going to get you a one-way plane ticket. And we're here for you every moment if you need anything. That's what the local church did here. Amen. Can you imagine? I mean, we can just try to pretend like we can be in the New Testament church, right? Man, why is this not going on? It should be, right? Oh, that our hearts would burn like that. And we'd have willing people that were able to say, hey, listen, my life, cash it all out for Christ. I've had it all my needs met. What can I not give back to him that he hasn't already given to me? Does that make sense? See, people that have that mentality, they're fueled by one simple thought. It's this. How beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. How can they hear unless they're sent? They can't. There's no plan B. This is it. But I love the promise. How beautiful are the feet of those who are willing to go. Paul and Barnabas received the calling. They went, right? What are the fruits of that? I can say, raise your hand. Almost all of you would probably come from what would be called a Gentile background unless you have Jewish ancestry. So Paul and Barnabas, they take the message first to the Jews. As they're rejected, they go straight on through and fulfill their calling, which is actually to go to the Gentiles. And somehow, in the providence of God, that lands in Geneva. And all those rednecks hear the gospel. And now we're here today celebrating because why? I don't miss this. A local church did what they were supposed to do. There's a moy this morning, at some point, I don't know how the time change works, gathering around a New Testament, Amen. studying the word. Amen. Think about that. Because a little church in Geneva got a message from Paul and Barnabas, right, through years of progress, and now they're going to take that, and I guarantee you they're taking it out. Amen. See, this is how missions works, Right? Local church fulfilling. All missions is through the local church, by the way. I believe it should all be rooted in the local church. And here's what we're doing. We're simply picking up the baton and carrying it. All right. Application now. What is your greatest need today? To be righteous before your God. Thank you for the three people that got that. <laughs> Luckily, I still have 45 minutes, so I'm going to preach it again like Pastor Conrad does. <laughs> I'll tell it to you and then tell it again and then tell it again, right? <laughs> Maybe that's why he does that, by the way. <laughs> Something to be said here, maybe. I'm not sure. Sorry, Pastor Conrad. <laughs> have you believed in your heart and confessed with your mouth, mouth that Christ is your Savior? I pray so. If not, here in a few moments, Jim's going to play. I'm going to sing. Uh, elders, if you guys are available, if that's okay, if anybody comes up to pray. Uh, if you decide this morning, today is the day you need to confess your faith before this congregation, we'll give you an opportunity to do that, okay? And then we'll give you a subsequent opportunity at baptism, too, in a few weeks, okay? Um, but that's your opportunity. That's the greatest need, right? If you don't have that settled today, everything else, kind of let that push to the side, this is your greatest dilemma because you are slowly marching towards death. The deathbeds are calling. And it may feel like a long way away, but beloved, it's a wink, isn't it? You guys that are 70, was it a wink? Whew, man, it feels like a wink to me. Don't presume upon tomorrow, the scripture would say. Confess with your mouth and believe in your heart. The second thing is this. Our, what do we need to be doing today question. And that's sharing the gospel. And I would ask, has the gospel proclamation kind of dried up in your heart? Come today. Let the Lord light the fire again. I mean, have we open-handed lived our lives for missions? Man, some of you, I know today, God could do exactly what he did in that church in Acts. He could burden your heart so heavy this morning, you can't walk out of here without knowing the Lord's called you into missions. 
And man, that could be somebody from the age of 12 to the age of 80. I mean, God could call you to missions at 80. So you don't blow your retirement on just fancy things like seashells, right? <laughs> or playing on the beach. Use your last years for Christ. Amen. There's an eternity waiting. There'll be plenty of times for relaxing and enjoyment, right? Blow it out this last few years. You got more freedom than anybody does. Invest in that next generation. Don't make these last years just about yourself. Amen? Amen. I, uh, the song we're going to sing says, Oh, Lord, please light the fire that once burned bright and clear in my heart regarding missions. Replace the lamp of my first love that used to burn with holy fear. And so today, that's the opportunities, right? If you need to get your greatest need solved today, come today. Uh, if you need to, on the flip side, have a new fire for missions uh, today, let the Lord do that. Amen? So the altar's open. We're going to sing if you want to stand as we uh, pray.